acknowledge our alumnus, former colleague, judge of appeal, and retired visiting professor, Clive Plaskett, who has come all the way from Plettenberg Bay, I believe, for the event. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of retired judges of the Eastern Cape Division, Jeremy Pickering and Judith Robertson. And lastly, and perhaps by no means least, I acknowledge the guest of honour, retired judge of appeal and visiting professor Azar Kachalia. So, we are humbled by your presence. Allow me now to hand over the podium to Professor Cruz, who will introduce our guest speaker, as well as the conversation and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Corals. Um, I was looking through my correspondence, and it was way back in 2019 that we harassed Professor Kachalia to join our faculty. Uh, in 2020, he became a visiting professor and it has taken us this long to get him here in person, COVID being the primary reason. But this is the moment we have waited for for a long time, and I'm delighted that Pro Professor Kachalia can speak to us at this particular point in our constitutional democracy on such an important topic. It would not be wrong to say that Prof. Kachalia is constitution, much in the same way as the U.S.'s Democratic Party's presumptive presidential nominee, Kamala Harris, is brat. In his youth, Kachalia was an anti, Kachalia J.A. was an anti-apartheid activist and involved himself as a founding member of the UDF, the United Democratic Front, and in student movements at Witz and in Benoni. His involvement in freedom activities in the apartheid era landed him in detention several times with him being banned in terms of the Internal Security Act between 1981 and 1983. He practiced as a partner at the renowned law firm of Cheadle, Hayson and Hayson, uh, Cheadle Thompson and Hayson. During the transition to democracy, he served as an advisor to the Constitutional Assembly and as a convener of the team that drafted the new Police Act thereafter becoming the chief policy advisor to the Minister of Safety and Security. He subsequently resumed legal practice, was appointed to the bench, and served as a judge for 20 years, with those later years in the Supreme Court of Appeal and as an acting judge in the Constitutional Court. He has also played an active part in the International Commission of Jurists, both as a commissioner and as an EXCO member. In the academic sphere, not to be outdone, he has published a book and two articles and has had fellowships with the Legal Resources Center in South Africa, as well as Yale University and New York University in the United States. Currently, he is the chairperson of Freedom Under Law, an organization that promotes democracy and the advancement of the rule of law and the principle of legality. He is on the editorial board of the South African Law Journal, but most importantly, at least tonight, he is a visiting professor at the Faculty of Law, Rhodes University. His reported judgments are testament to his active contribution to the discipline of law. The variety and the complexity of the issues that he has adjudicated and written judgments on is nothing short of staggering. Having hung up his robes, he has not stopped in his constitutional quest. No longer writing judgments, he now shares with us his insights in the current state, into the current state of our Judicial Service Commission. Professor Kachalia.
Thank you, Professor Cruz. <clears throat> My topic this evening is on the question of whether the Judicial Service Commission is fit for purpose. And this is really a personal reflection of more than 15 years uh, an observation and a reflection of what I believe has happened uh, to the Judicial Service Commission. <coughs> South Africa's democracy is anchored by its constitution and the rule of law. Judges are the guardians of both. They derive their authority from their competence and their integrity. And without either, they have none. Who and how judges are appointed is the focus of this lecture. The Judicial Service Commission has two functions. It appoints judges and investigates complaints against them for misconduct. The JSC must protect the independence of the judiciary by appointing competent and ethical persons and safeguard it from undue political interference. It follows that those appointed to the JSC to perform these functions must themselves be fit for purpose. Section 174 of the Constitution governs the appointment of judges. It requires the judiciary to broadly reflect the racial and gender composition of South Africa and that those appointed to it be fit and proper persons. In 1998, under the stewardship of the then Chief Justice, the JSC developed guidelines and criteria to assist it with this task. In short, it required candidates to be technically competent and able to give expression to the values in the Constitution. Importantly, the needs of the court to which the candidate sought appointment was also a consideration. For just over a decade, the JSC functioned without significant complaint. South Africa took its place among leading demo democratic countries, lauded for its progressive constitution and its independent judiciary. There was, however, increasing disquiet about the functioning of the JSC. The application of Section 174 and the guidelines were ignored and distorted, giving rise to arbitrary decision making. As far back as 2011, the National Development Plan warned that there was little consensus between the JSC and the legal fraternity concerning the attributes required for appointment to the bench. More alarmingly, it observed that the JSC was becoming hamstrung by political and vested interests within the profession. Sadly, instead of acting on these concerns, the situation was allowed to worsen. In the time available, I shall endeavor to provide some context for how this happened, point to particular instances to demonstrate the JSC's failure to execute its mandate and conclude by drawing attention to attempts by civil society, including through litigation, to bring pressure to bear on it to perform its constitutional mandate properly. 2009 is an important moment. The 2009 JSC hearings for four vacancies in the Constitutional Court was a defining moment, both for the JSC and the Constitutional Court. To understand its significance, one must recall the events leading to it. In 2005, Mr. Shabir Sheikh, a Durban businessman, was convicted and sentenced on two corruption charges. Mr. Jacob Zuma, then the deputy president of the country was implicated in having received corrupt payments from Sheikh. 
As a consequence, President Mbeki dismissed Zuma from the government. In August that year, acting on search warrants issued by a judge, the Directorate of Special Prosecutions, also known as the Scorpions, searched several premises and seized documents and computer equipment relevant to a criminal investigation against Zuma. Shortly thereafter, he was charged with 18 counts of racketeering, corruption, money laundering, tax evasion, and fraud. Meanwhile, Sheikh's appeals to the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court failed, and he was imprisoned. Zuma and his co-accused, Tint, a French company, challenged the validity of the warrants. After the courts in Pretoria and Durban had delivered conflicting judgments, the SCA, by a majority, found the search warrants valid. They appealed to the Constitutional Court. In December 2007, Zuma was elected leader of the ANC, replacing President Mbeki. Many of Zuma's supporters were elected to its NEC. These events would cause a seismic shift in the governance of the country, including the JSC. The appeal by Zuma and Tint to the CC was heard on the 11th, from the 11th to the 13th of March, 2008. Judgment was reserved, but on the 13th of March, 2008, John, John Flaubert, then Judge President of the Western Cape High Court, suborned two judges of the court to rule in Zuma's favor, adding to them, you are our last hope, close quotes, an exhortation for them to clear the path for Zuma's assumption to power as president. The judges of the Constitutional Court reported Flopez's dishonorable conduct to the JSC. He denied the accusation, dismissing it as politically driven by the then Chief Justice Pius Langa and the Deputy Chief Justice Dijang Moseneke. In 2008, in July of 2008, the CC dismissed Zuma's and Tint's appeal on the validity of the search warrants. There was one dissent by Justice Sandile Ngobo who would have invalidated the search warrants. The decision by the court provoked a torrent of outrage by Zuma's supporters. The newly elected Secretary General of the ANC falsely accused the judges of conspiring against Zuma stigmatized them as counter-revolutionary and added, without evidence, that their complaint against Flope was orchestrated to undermine Zuma. During Zuma's tenure as president, these malicious accusations against the judiciary continued and permeated the JSC. In September 2008, the KwaZulu-Natal High Court controversially declared the decision to prosecute Zuma invalid. The National Director of Public Prosecutions appealed, and in January 2009, the SCA unanimously upheld the appeal against this judgment, allowing Zuma's prosecution to continue. The threat posed by a criminal prosecution obviously weighed on Zuma. And soon after being elected president of the Republic in April 2009, he took aim at the JSC. The JSC hearings for the Constitutional Court scheduled for 8 June were postponed to September at the last minute at the request of the Justice Minister. The JSC statement at the time cited the, quote, vital question of transformation, close quotes, as the reason for the postponement, which sounded anodyne, but was ominous. 
President Zuma then hastily replaced four commissioners who had served during Mbeki's tenure, one of whom was the celebrated George Bezos, with four commissioners of his choice. The ANC also used its majority in the National Council of Promises to replace the opposition delegate on the JSC, inviting the suggestion that the JSC was now being packed with its supporters. In July 2009, as these events unfolded, the JSC appointed an investigation committee consisting of three of its members, a judge and two senior lawyers to conduct a preliminary inquiry into the Constitutional Court's complaint against Hlobe and his complaint against them. Despite there being material disputes of fact between the parties, the committee strangely decided against cross-examination to establish the truth. In August of that year, the JSC, which had a substantially changed membership, shockingly decided that the case against Lobe did not disclose a prima facie case of gross misconduct warranting a full inquiry, a decision which public interest NGO freedom under law would challenge in the courts. The newly formed JSC reconvened in September 2009. There were initially 25 candidates for judicial office, but some withdrew. 20 were interviewed. It was apparent during the interviews that there were dubious political agendas at play. In an understatement, Olafira and Hoekstra observed that the manner in which the interviews were conducted were markedly inconsistent. I quote, certain candidates were asked more intrusive questions and occasionally aggressive questions on the subject of transformation, while others, including Judge Mukwain, were asked anodyne and unchallenging questions that failed to probe their suitability for appointment. Since then, tough questions on transformation have continued to be put sometimes in a confront confrontational and irascible manner." Close quotes. I had the misfortune to be one of the candidates and had a robust exchange with two of the commissioners who were really not interested in assessing my suitability for appointment. One of them, the ANC's appointee and a lawyer by training, disclosed that his approach to appointing judges was to promote the National Demo Democratic Revolution. He implied that this required him to advance the interests of, open quotes, blacks in general and Africans in particular, close quotes. I insisted that transformation is not a numbers game. It was apparent that he was either not interested or had no conception of what Section 174 of the Constitution or the guidelines then applicable to the appointment of judges required of him. It was an abject abuse of power, and I refused to indulge him in this charade. Another commissioner inappropriately wanted to settle a personal score he had with a retired justice of the Constitutional Court who had been critical of the JSC's handling of the complaint against Lope. He pushed me, uh, pushed me to answer irrelevant questions about the justice, which again, I refused to. Another candidate, a brilliant lawyer, and one who has consistently represented disadvantaged litigants, was asked by an ANC representative why he always accepted briefs against the government, implying that in doing so he had some animus against it. Yeah. The candidate was not appointed. The commissioner was promoted to justice minister. These were but some, but not all the instances of how the interviews were compromised. 
The post-interview deliberations lasted only 30 to 40 minutes and produced a short list of seven candidates for the president, suggesting that some of the choices were predetermined, which further damaged the credibility of the process. Flope, who was a candidate, was not recommended for appointment. Mired in controversy, his appointment would have been a breach too far, even for a Zuma-friendly JSC. One of the judges who ultimately was appointed was Justice Ampepe, who served the court with distinction. Zuma would have rude appointing her. Before she retired recently, she wrote the majority judgment finding him guilty of contempt of court and sentenced him to 15 months imprisonment. After the appalling behavior of some of the commissioners, I never returned to the JSC as a candidate. I was not the first and would not be the last. Shortly thereafter, in October 2009, Zuma appointed Justice Ngobo as the Chief Justice. Some suggested, perhaps unfairly, that, that he was being rewarded for his dissent in the search warrants case against Zuma. The Deputy Chief Justice Moseneke, who had been appointed to the court by Mbeki, was overlooked after a benign comment he had made at a private birthday function was seized upon by the ANC as evidence that he was ill-disposed to them, towards them. Meanwhile, the Flaubert cloud remained. In 2011, Freedom Under Law succeeded in having the courts invalidate the JSC decision to drop the investigation into his misconduct. Compelled to continue the investigation, a Judicial Conduct Tribunal was scheduled for 30 September 2013 but was confronted with a regrettable turn of events. Two justices of the court, Jafta and Kabinde, who had first reported John Clope's conduct, appeared reticent to testify. They challenged the, the J, JCT's jurisdiction to hear the matter on technical grounds. Their objection failed. They appealed to a full court and lost then to the SCA, which dismissed their appeal, lamenting the delay caused by this futile litigation. Undeterred, they appealed further to the Constitutional Court, the very court in which they were members, again unsuccessfully. And when they inevitably failed, they incomprehensibly sought to rescind the judgment and were embarrassingly told in the court's judgment that they could not do so. The judgment was delivered on the 24th of August 2016, 10 years since the original complaint. The Judicial Conduct Tribunal reconvened only two years later. This time, Clope sought the presiding judge's recusal on the ground that he had allegedly made disparaging remarks about him at a social gathering an allegation the judge denied, he nonetheless recused himself, delaying the matter yet again. The matter was able to proceed only in December 2020 before a tribunal. On this occasion, Jafta and Kabinda testified. The tribunal rendered its carefully, resigned, carefully reasoned decision on 9 April 2021 finding Clope guilty of gross misconduct. On the 25th of August 2021, the JSC voted by 8 to, to 4 to recommend his impeachment. The four votes in his favour by lawyers demonstrated that some of its members would protect him to the very end, even in the face of a damning an answerable case against him. It took a further year for the JSC to recommend that President Ramaphosa suspend him. Flope was impeached last year and after an overwhelming and unprecedented vote by the National Assembly 
on the 21st, 21st of February 2024. He was removed by the President as a judge 16 years after the complaint against him was first made. There were few left to protect him. Or so it was thought. In my next section, I'm going to refer to the JSC's failure to fulfill its constitutional mandate. <clears throat> and in this section, I shall draw on Fool's research and analysis of the JSC's functioning as the Zuma presidency strengthened its grip over the state and its institutions. Full assessed how candidates were interviewed, the application of the JSC's guidelines and criteria, including race and gender, and importantly, the adverse impact of political interference. The assessment, which covered the period until 2022, including through the Rama Ramaphosa presidency, paints a sorry picture of the JSC's failure to execute its mandate properly and lawfully, and emphasize the need for urgent reform. I shall point to a few instances, given the time constraints, to demonstrate this failure. In April 2011, the JSC interviewed seven candidates for the Western Cape High Court, of which Tlope was the JP. There were three vacancies. A black male, or quote, colored according to government statistics, was appointed. The other candidates, a white female, Miss Clutie, and five white males, including the respected Owen Rogers, were not. This left two vacancies. The irresistible inference was that there was an undeclared, unconstitutional policy not to appoint any white candidate. The courts invalidated the hearings and directed the JSC to reconsider the application. The subsequent interviews, two years later, considered eight candidates for five vacancies. On this occasion, the JSC filled all the vacancies, including appointing Rogers and Clutie, an implied admission that they were wrongly not appointed on the, in the, during the earlier hearing. Rogers is currently a member of the Constitutional Court. Later that year, after an aborted attempt to unconstitutionally extend Chief Justice Ngobo's term, President Zuma controversially nominated the recently appointed Justice Mohueng Mohueng as Chief Justice. Again ignoring the stronger and widely supported Deputy Chief Justice Mosenege. The subsequent confirmation hearing, which is really what it was, of the JSC was an unedifying spectacle, with a majority of its members giving the appearance that they were Justice Mohueng's defense counsel, rather than independent guardians of the judiciary. In response to a question from one of the more skeptical commissioners I ever, he said he believed that his appointment had been ordained by God. He recently said that uh, God also had a plan to make him the president of the country. I, w I await to see God's hand with an, a mixture of anticipation and trepidation. In July 2012, four candidates were nominated for appointment to the Constitutional Court. One of them was Justice Zondo who was then a recently appointed High Court judge. He had served in the Labour Appeal Court with little evidence of significant constitutional experience. Another was the exceptional Judge Nugent from the SCA, 
whose contribution to the law, including constitutional law, was formidable. Zondo was given a friendly interview, in contrast to Nugent, who was interrogated on why he had withdrawn earlier as a candidate in 2009. He explained that at the time he had little confidence in the JSC because of the way it had dealt with the Schlope complaint. His answer aggravated rather than modified them. Zuma appointed Zondo, a decision he once again came to regret after Zondo's damning findings against him at the State Capture Commission. That the JSC had become mired in political intrigue, bad decision-making and unconstitutional conduct was evidence. In April, Isaac Smuts was here with us today. The, the then Bar Council's representative on the JSC resigned. He explained <coughs> that the JSC had failed to appoint candidates of, and I quote him, of intellectual forensic excellence steeped in the values of the Constitution, close quotes. A statement he qualified by adding that the issue was more nuanced than simply not appointing white males. The reasons he gave for his resignation accorded with the observations of many, including my own. The JSC ignored the criticism. Worth it doubled down. Immediately thereafter, Judge Plaskett, who is also with us this evening, and who had a distinguished career on the Eastern Cape bench, was overlooked for appointment to the SCA. During his interview, he was subjected to a heated exchange on transformation. In contrast, other candidates had congenial interviews. He was ultimately appointed, though, at his fifth attempt, a few years later, after having endured an unspeakable humiliation to which others have also been subjected. In 2015, interviews for the Constitutional Court, uh, uh, for the Constitutional Court followed after Sudanese President al-Bashir, indicted by the ICC for war crimes, was allowed to leave the country in contravention of a High Court order. Justice Minister Masuta questioned the interviewees about judges being, quote, dangerously wrong, close quotes. But on this occasion, the courts were not wrong. The government was, first to ignore a court order, and second for the minister to misuse the JSC for political purposes. During the April 2021 interviews for the Constitutional Court, the questioning of the candidates caused public outrage at the apparent hostility shown to Judge Dyer Palais, among others, who had recently ruled against the Zuma in the High Court. Commissioner Malema, an MP, made baseless, racially loaded allegations against her, including her including accusing her of pursuing a political agenda. Instead of rebuking him, the Chief Justice Mokwen joined the Inquisition. Their behavior prompted yet another review to declare the sitting unlawful and unconstitutional. The Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution, CASAC, which launched the review, argued that the JSC was being used for political and other ulterior purposes, including commissioners questioning judges who had made rulings against them and attempting to settle scores against judges against whom they held grudges. Palay was not the only candidate who had endured the travesty. Ultimately, the JSC was unable to defend itself and agreed to rerun the interviews. Judge Pillay, though, had had enough and never returned. Meanwhile, at the state capture inquiry, evidence of the governing party's mis political misuse of the JSC was laid bare when it emerged that the ANC's secretive deployment committee 
had identified judges for appointing for appointment, including and especially to the Constitutional Court and the SCA. It hardly availed its president, Ramaphosa, who testified on its behalf to suggest that its members on the JSC were not bound by the recommendations of its deployment committee. In April 2022, after much pressure from NGOs and others, the JSC adopted new guidelines. This too seemed to have had little disciplining effect on many of its members. I'm now going to talk about two of Freedom Under Law's current court reviews. Now, in October last year, the JSC conducted interviews to fill four vacancies in the SCA after several senior judges had retired. And over the last decade, the court had lost skilled judges who the JSC failed to replace with suitable appointments. The loss was particularly acute in commercial law, a problem that has become manifest at all levels of the judiciary, including the Constitutional Court. One reason why commercial litigants choose arbitration rather than than going to the courts. In a replay of the impugned 2011 interviews for the Western Cape High Court, 10 candidates were interviewed for five vacancies. Only two were appointed, leaving three vacancies, despite there being several eminently suitable candidates. One who failed to make the cut was Judge David Unterhalter, a lawyer and a judge of vast experience in many areas of the law, including constitutional and commercial law. He had earlier also been controversially overlooked for appointment to the Constitutional Court. The failure to appoint him and others was roundly criticized by legal commentators. Asked to provide reasons for its decisions not to fill all the vacancies, the JSC explained that only two of the candidates had received 12 or more votes, the threshold of votes required there being 24 commissioners. The JSC was unable to provide convincing or any reasons why only two of the judges were considered suitable for appointment. This is because commissioners vote by secret ballot without providing reasons. It reminds me of an, an, an an anecdote of a, a law professor at one of our universities who uh, uh, lectured contract law. And after more than half his classroom had failed, the vice chancellor called him to ask him why there were so many failures. And his answer was, because they didn't have enough marks. <laughs> So full instituted review proceedings against the JSC seeking relief in two parts. In part eight sought an order for the JSC to reconvene urgently to consider whether or not the candidates to fill the remaining uh, uh, vacancies were qualified to fill them. That the matter was urgent was evident from the crisis in the SCA. In part B we sought an order that the JSC publish assessment criteria that requires each member to assess candidates in writing against the published criteria. This is a basic, basic method used by HRC practitioners, by HR practitioners, including in universities. But what the JSC did disclose in response to the review was startling. Its confidential deliberations followed the public interviews revealed that the deputy president of the SCA had motivated four candidates for appointment. His strongest pitch was for Unterhalter, who he described as a, quote, big hitter, close quotes, 
with vast skill, who took more than his share of work. He had the support, he, he added, of all the senior members of the court. The Chief Justice, Zondo, supported, appointing two candidates, including Unterhalter. He was followed by Minister Lamola, the Justice Minister, who also supported Unterhalter, even though he thought, I quote, he tried to be too clever, close quotes, during his interview. <coughs> this was followed by Commissioner Singh, an MP, who supported three of the candidates recommended by the Deputy, Pre uh, Deputy President of the Court, but not Unterhalter. Singh's view of him was, and I quote, he is a great jurist, but he did not give me the impression that he was a team player, close quotes. It's an astonishing remark in the light of the contrary view of all the SCA judges. Commissioner de Dovo then followed. He preferred another candidate and would not recommend Unterhalter because he believed he was, quote, arrogant, close quotes, and had a sense of entitlement and self-importance, close quotes. So he preferred appointing a judge, Huele, who he described as a black African woman, close quotes, instead of Unterhalter. Commissioner Malema came next. He had nothing to say about any of the candidates other than Unterhalter. What he did say amounted, amounted to crude racial stereotyping and revealed the depths of the discourse to which the JSC had now sunk. And I quote him verbatim. A well-experienced judge who has been before us many times, who has a sense of entitlement and superiority. I like the racism of Afrikaners because they don't hide it. I will never support subtle racism that masquerades itself as being intelligent. I don't agree with the minister that he was trying to be clever. He was being himself. A person who looks down at very senior judges because they are of a very different color. We have dealt with such characters before who felt they could go to the constitutional court. He comes across as arrogant and intellectually superior the racism of liberals. That's what I want to say about him. Close quotes. So one or two other commissioners echoed the uns unsubstantiated claim of arrogance against Unterhalter, with one observing that he is a good judge, but added the disqualifier, one cannot take away the appearance of arrogance. An attempt by Commissioners Baloy and Nkai Tobi, both respected silks and recent appointments to the JSC to introduce some rationality into the process, failed to gain sufficient traction. They emphasized the importance of giving due weight to the recommendations of the head of the court, that humility and arrogance are not disqualifying criteria and that in any event do not out outweigh other factors that redound to a candidate's credit. Mukai Tobi was severe in his criticism of his fellow commissioners, who he said were treating the looming crisis in the SCA, SCA lightly. He argued that Unterhalter was the only candidate singled out for criticism, except for one other. He insisted that it is untrue that he is not a team player, a rebuke directed at Commissioner Singh. His own experience before him, he explained, was that he was pleasant to appear in front of. In regard to the allegations of entitlement, arrogance and racism, he pointed out correctly that no one had put any of these allegations to him during the interview. He added that Unterhalter was not without his flaws, 
one being that he had perhaps not read the mood of the room, but added that he was head and shoulders above the other candidates. He emphasized that Unterhalter was the only judge among those interviewed who had a clear theory of how to reconcile the common law with the Constitution. Only 12 of the 23 commissioners expressed their views. The Chief Justice then called for the vote. There were two rounds. Only two candidates obtained 12 or more votes. They were appointed. Bear in mind the threshold is 24. Unterhalter received 11 votes and was not appointed, as were none of the others. Two posts were thus left vacant, despite there being suitable candidates to fill them, and despite clear judicial authority since the 2011 debacle in the, w, in the Western Cape High Court, that a failure to appoint suitable candidates for vacancies without good reason was unlawful. The JSC realized it would not be able to defend its failure to fill the vacant positions once again. Also clear was that the apparent, though not clearly articulated, reasons for not appointing Unterhalter in particular were unlawful. That he was allegedly arrogant was not a disqualifying factor, even if true. The allegation of racism was baseless, highly prejudicial, and constituted unfair discrimination prohibited by the Constitution. The record revealed that several commissioners used irrelevant considerations laced with personal invective <coughs> and overlooked relevant considerations in voting the way they did. Regrettably, the Chief Justice's chair gave no guidance on these matters be before calling for the vote. He thus abdicated his constitutional duty to ensure a fair process and a satisfactory outcome. The JSC was therefore constrained to agree under pressure of the Freedom Under Law Review to re-advertise the vacancies before the scheduled hearing in October this year, and did so in May, two months ago, and filled the three vacancies advertised. Two of those were filled by Unterhalter and Judge Smith from this division, who were both deemed not suitable just two months earlier. However, the issues that gave rise to the relief sought in Part A of the full review, especially the failure to apply the guidelines adopted for appointments clearly and consistently, and which form the basis of the Part B review for the JSC to adopt clear assessment criteria remain. The first aspect here is the duty to provide reasons, a requirement that lies at the heart of the exercise of public power. The JSC is unable to distill proper reasons for its deliberations because it's vote, it votes in secret after its deliberations. This means that we have no idea why commissioners vote the way they do and is unfair and prejudicial to unsuccessful candidates. I have described the irregular and unlawful manner of the JSC's functioning for more than a decade. The critical problem initially was the absence of a clear set of guidelines which informed all candidates and commissioners what was expected of them. And when the guidelines were adopted, they were routinely ignored by the JSC. This much is apparent from the JSC's failure to defend its processes when faced with judicial scrutiny. The need for assessment criteria so that commissioners are obliged to disclose their reasoned assessment of each candidate is therefore imperative. Without this, the JSC is unable to assess candidates fairly. The public interest <coughs> demands a fair process, and full now awaits a court date to confront these issues. The last section I will go on to briefly is Parliament's recent designated members for the JSC. 
The Zondo Commission's investigations revealed how key role players enabled state capture to take hold in state entities, which Parliament, then dominated by a single party, ignored. The President undertook to act on its recommendations, and when the seventh Parliament was elected, there was an expectation that it would act to fix the institutions that required fixing, and it was hoped that Parliament would designate suitable candidates suitable persons to serve on the JSC. Hardly a difficult task. It failed dismally by appointing two members who were clearly not suitable, Malema and Flope. Malema has consistently abused his authority on the JSC. He has also been found guilty of breaching the parliamentary members code of conduct. He had a inappropriately questioned a judge being interviewed by the JSC in 2021 about a ruling the judge made against him, Malema, in a defamation action, a matter in which he had a personal interest. In that matter, the judge had held that Malema had defamed Mr. Trevor, Ma Trevor Manuel by causing falsehoods about him to be published. Turning to Flope again, once the CC had invalidated Zuma's quest to lead his newly formed party, Umkonto Vesizwe, MK, in Parliament due to his criminal conviction for contempt of court, MK then dubiously anointed the disgraced Flope to be its parliamentary leader, and then cynically nominated him to be to be one of Parliament's representatives on the JSC. Full and several other NGOs wrote to the Speaker to register their indignation. They cautioned that Flope's appointment would subvert Parliament's duty to guard the independence of the judiciary and be legally, legally assailable. The Speaker responded that there was no legal requirement for persons appointed to the JSC to be, quote, fit and proper, close quotes, nor any other legal impediment to his appointment. With respect, she was ill-advised. The National Assembly thus proceeded to select Floppy to serve on the JSC, the very body that found him guilty of gross misconduct and unfit to be a judge. As a member of the JSC, he will now have to decide whether candidates for judicial office meet the high ethical standards to be appointed as judges. Standards that he felt no need to adhere to as a judge. This is akin to asking the fox to guard the hen house. We have a duty to object to the cynical exercise of public power. And Full has approached the courts to invalidate his appointment on at least three grounds. First, we say the National Assembly was incorrect, that it was bound to accept MK's nomination of Flope. It has a discretion to appoint members who are suitable to serve on the JSC, which it failed to exercise. And to the extent that it believed it did not have a discretion, it made a mistake of law. Second, Section 165.4 of the Constitution obliges Parliament to take steps to protect the independence of the judiciary and the public's confidence in it. Appointing Flope to the JSC is completely at odds with that obligation. And third, appointing Flope was irrational and unreasonable. A, a decision is irrational if it undermines the purpose for which it was taken. The core purpose of the JSC is to foster public confidence in the JSC and in turn the individuals who are selected to be judges. The very reason that Flope was removed as a judge was because the JSC and the National Assembly found his continued involvement in the judiciary would threaten the public's confidence in it. Appointing Flope to the JSC means that he is again involved in the judiciary in the key role of interviewing and deciding on the appointment of new judges. 
and that this involvement too threatens the public confidence in the judiciary. So we seek an urgent court hearing to reverse this untenable development. The Democratic Alliance and several other NGOs shall also be asking the court to invalidate this appointment. And I understand that a date has been negotiated for early next month. So let me conclude. In my years on the bench, and thereafter as a member of Freedom Under Law, and now the chairman of its board, I and many others have sought to arrest the decline of the JSC by raising our voices. But it has increasingly abused its power and became captured by political interests, it has been laid bare. But it was not only the politicians on the JSC who were responsible for this. Some judges have acquiesced in this development, and senior lawyers with vested interests have not only watched, but have also been complicit. Some of them, the storied Justice Cameron recently described as, quote, dangerous, close quotes. He trenchantly commented, and I quote him, they seek to propel an agenda. They are skilled liars, dissemblers, manipulators, and propagandists. They employ the instruments of legal practice to bedevil, confuse, and dismay. They have even used the JSC to wreck the advancement of conscientious and capable candidates for judicial preferment. Close quotes. The consequence of the combined conduct of these malevolent actors, often aided and abetted, abetted by the insipid amongst them, has been a loss of public confidence in the JSC, an institution that is vital to ensure the competence of the judiciary and protect its independence from political and other interests. Without this, the rule of law is impelled. I ask Rhodes University and the graduates from its iconic law faculty to be vigilant, to speak out and not to look the other way. Thank you. say this about all our state institutions and including the JSC that we have to fight to save our institutions our country and our constitution they are all under attack from malevolent, malevolent actors in every sphere and, and uh, for those of us who live in this country and who value the rule of law and our constitution we have to defend it it's not good enough to, to keep quiet let me say this that there are loud voices out there they use social media they threaten people but I promise you their bark is louder than their bite push them back and they'll retreat. <coughs> Come, there must be a few more questions. Right? 
at least some abuse. See when 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 the JSC when the decision was made and the constitution was drafted, I think it's important just to take us just a step back quickly. In the old days, the Minister of Justice made the appointments. He was a politician. He made good appointments. He made very bad appointments. But he was accountable, and the buck stopped there. Uh, now this big body, the JSC, were not even obliged individually to give their reasons. We actually don't know. So that there's this opaque body that's 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 functioning, frankly, in almost a law-free zone. Now, the reason, and you put your finger on it, the reason that parliamentarians were, were appointed was because the truth is that parliament and the politicians and it's have, have an interest. They have an interest in, in good judges being appointed. They have a good, an interest in, in whether the judges are faithfully executing their responsibilities as, as judges. Are the judges giving effect to our constitutional values? Are their judicial philosophies congruent with the Constitution? It seems to me those are all important political considerations and not simply legal ones. So there is a debate now whether one should remove politicians. I, I would caution against that. Uh, because I think that what can be done, and when it, if, it, if one fixes it, it's not too difficult. So take, for example, the, the, if our clear assessment criteria our, uh, and our guidelines are properly adhered to. And here, this is not rocket science. If the Chief, if the chief Justice who chairs Says, says to Commissioner A or Commissioner B, sorry, you have to withdraw that question. That is irregular. After deliberation, you say we've heard, we've heard several comments. You are not allowed to take comment one, two, three, four into consideration. It's, it's like in a, in a jury system where, where, the, where uh, a, a jury sits at the end of the trial, the judge directs the jury to take into account only admissible evidence and to disregard inadmissible evidence. All of that would be part of the record. A bit of training, I mean, the parliamentarians for the most part have at least a 
many of them have basic education, they've been through high school, many have been through universities, others boast that they are doctors. <laughs> so, so the, 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 you know, uh, the, the parliament has a, the, the, they, they are there to make policy. And frankly, they are all trainable. We may not be able to prevent them from grandstanding because they always need to make a political point. But I think they can be made to perform their duty. And if they don't, there's an example. Malema was charged by the, the Ethics Committee in Parliament and found guilty. If more of that sort of thing happens, <coughs> if, if uh, political parties are put under pressure by their constituents to nominate proper people, I mean, uh, the ANC has just come now after a reflection and believe that they've made some very serious mistakes. Well, they believed that before, so I'm not sure what's going to be different now. But the truth of the matter is the country has changed. All the political parties are looking at themselves. There's a contestation. So I think the arrogance, their arrogance of the political parties as opposed to any judicial arrogance, perhaps that may be, become, may, may be less pronounced as they, they have to contest votes. So in short, I'm saying that I don't think the, the, uh, the, uh, the problem is too complex. All right, I think if you appoint, we're going to have a new Chief Justice. Well, I'd like to, I know her well, I'd like to have a discussion with her and say, Justice Meyer, are you prepared in the JSC to pull these people up? Or are you going to sit back, fold your arms, while they abuse candidates? I think those, and if a chief justice is responsible for steering, captaining the ship. So, that was a longer answer than you, that, than you needed, but, but that's my answer. Thank you so much, Professor. Too late, you should have taken notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let me just quickly check whether there's an online question, um, okay. because there are people online. Let me just check if there are questions. Okay, so you are off the hook, oh, and good. it is time to hand over to my colleague who will wrap things up. Well, not to hand over to me, but to hand over to the President of the Lord Society. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank our visiting professor, Azar Kachalia. Your wisdom and insight has been really invaluable. We have lots of Rhodes alumni in the legal fraternity who come here and give um, their lectures. They tell us how they used to sit right here where we sit now in our final year, in our penultimate years. And really, it speaks to the guidance that you can offer us as future leaders for tomorrow, as the people who will one day be those chief justices and those members <laughs> on the JC. <laughs> so thank you so much for your contribution tonight, and please accept our token of appreciation.
Actually, by the way, we do know the contract lecturer you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell him that you spoke about it tonight. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to thank all our guests, including the members of the League of Fraternity who are here tonight. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. This really means a lot to us. Also to the students who've taken our time from their studies to be here tonight to engage with our visiting professor. Thank you so much. And after this, please could we just make our way outside to the benches in front of the faculty. There'll be drink and food for everyone there. Thank you so much.